Who are some of the worst politicians that love to scam the public? Let's get right into their stories. Story 4. Pretty Woman Mario Zelaya was a Honduran politician who is the director of the Institute for Social Security, which handles health issues. He was an accomplished man, orthopedic surgeon, and military veteran who was married with three children. One day, while on a business trip to Chile, he met a woman named Natalia Schifferardi. Natalia worked at a brothel and was a high-class lady of the night who sold her services for upwards of 300 euros per hour. Mario quickly became infatuated and proceeded to shower Natalia with expensive gifts the first night the star-crossed lovers met, Mario spent roughly 12,000 euros trying to impress her. After that, he built a relationship with Natalia and told her that he was going to take her away from where she worked. It was the foundation upon which most solid, long-lasting relationships are built, obviously. True to his promise, Mario spent loads of money on her. He bought her a house on the beach, two SUVs, and two different apartments. He also didn't tell her that he had a wife and three kids back home in Honduras. He probably didn't want her thinking he was a scumbag. But where did our Casanova Mario get all his money to spend? Well, he worked as the director of social security for Honduras, and the agency he headed had an annual budget of about 121 million pounds. Mario siphoned this money to buy all these extremely expensive gifts for his concubine. After a while into their relationship, Zelia got her pregnant and supplemented her earnings with monthly payments of about $5,000 per month so she could stop working. In early 20 2014, Mario's fraud was discovered and a Honduran court ordered his arrest. But before the arrest could be made, Mario fled the country. Ever the gentleman, Zelia did call Natalia to tell her that he would never see her again and to only tell his child good things about her. Because things like what people might think of a philandering politician who was stealing money from a much needed public health fund to take care of his side piece mattered to him. When the Honduran government couldn't find Mario, they turned their attention to Natalia. In her defense, Natalia says that she didn't know that Mario was spending stolen money on her and that she's innocent. If the Honduran government didn't even know the funds were stolen, how should she? Prosecutors allege that Natalia received real estate and cash through contracts with fake companies created to launder the stolen money. Since there's no extradition treaty between Honduras and Chile, Chiferardi hasn't been charged with anything and maintains her innocence. The police eventually found Mario and he was condemned to a 71 year prison sentence for passive bribery and the stockpiling of war and commercial weapons because it wasn't enough that he was stealing money from sick people. He also got an additional 31-year prison sentence for overhauling the purchase of construction materials and copper supplies by 389.52%. Number 3. Criminal Mentality John Woods is a former member of both houses of the Arkansas General Assembly. He was a state senator and was part of the assembly that passed laws for the people of Arkansas. However, aside from passing laws, the senators of that state also assign state grants to whatever organizations they wish. It was these grants that got John Woods both rich and his goose cooked. Today, the senator is serving an 18-year sentence for political corruption, money laundering, and wire and mail fraud. Woods' crimes were so deep that the judge who sentenced him said that they were evidence of a serious criminal mentality. That criminal mindset earned Woods an 18-year sentence even though the senator was a first-time offender. The judge could simply take no chances with Wood re-offending. What exactly did John Woods do to earn such strong comments? Between 2013 and 2015, John Woods used his position as a senator to direct government grants to two nonprofit organizations. Woods also advised a fellow senator, Meekin Neal to direct more government grants to the same two nonprofits, awarding over $600,000 to those two entities. Ordinarily, these awards would be perfectly legal, but because John and Nia didn't award the funds impartially, they were perfectly illegal since both received kickbacks and bribes to award the funds. Woods received at least $40,000 and Neal received at least $18,000. Court records reveal that both men were paid the monies by a consultant named Randall Shelton. Shelton got the money to pay both senators from Oren Paris III, the dean of one of the colleges the grants went to. Once the college received the grants, Oren Paris paid a portion of the money to an account controlled by Randall Shelton. Then Shelton kept a portion of the money for himself and dispersed the rest to Neil and Woods. Law enforcement was never able to specify exactly how much Woods and Neil got in kickbacks since most of it was paid in cash. However, However, there was evidence that Woods got a wire payment of about $40,000 from Randall, and that was part of the kick.
kickbacks he got in total for awarding the grants. When the FBI eventually caught wind of the scheme and charged Woods and Neal in court, their trial was delayed for several months. And the reason for the delay? It appeared that the FBI official investigating both Neal and Woods, Robert Cesario, had wiped his laptop clean three times since the investigation into both men began. This led to the loss of original material audio files and proved that both Neal and Woods were receiving bribes and committing fraud. This meant that the FBI had to start searching for ways to prove that they had an original recording for the trial to start. The astonishing thing about those recordings is that they were made by Neal and he turned them over to the police on his own volition. Despite that, most of the original copies ended up missing when Cesario, the officer in charge of the investigation, wiped his laptop thrice. Despite how bad these crimes are, they aren't Woods' first rodeo with being sneaky. In fact, in 2016, a complaint was lodged about him at the Arkansas State Ethics Commission. The claim against Woods was that he received illegal contributions to his election campaigns back in 2012. However, that complaint didn't go anywhere, and Ethics Committee voted 3 nothing to dismiss it. This time, Woods wasn't as lucky. A jury found him guilty of 15 counts of mail fraud, wire fraud, and money laundering. And he was sentenced to 220 months in federal prison. Neil was only sentenced to one year. But that that's not where the story ends. Woods wasn't content with doing his time, so he appealed the judgment to the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. The court affirmed the judgment of the lower court that sent Woods to jail. Two years later, Woods made yet another appeal, and the court unanimously rejected it. We guess John Woods must not be very appealing. Number two, a simple story of corruption. Brian Benjamin used to be the Lieutenant Governor of New York State and once contested for the Office of Comptroller for the state. As Lieutenant Governor, he was the stand-in for the Governor who would step into their position whenever the Governor was incapable of doing so, like a Vice Governor. Under the New York Constitution, he was also the President of the State Senate and was the second most important state official after the Governor. While working as Lieutenant Governor, Benjamin was accused of funneling state funds to secure private donations for his campaign fund. When the investigation into his legal dealings was announced, Benjamin eventually resigned after a few weeks of mounting pressure. Interestingly, Benjamin didn't admit to his crime. He actually argued that he should be praised for his actions as they were laudable. He also argued that after clearing his name at the court, he would be back to vying for public office. The corruption case of Brian Benjamin starts with a man named Jared Migdal. Benjamin and Migdal met around 2017 and built an interesting corporate relationship. At the time of their meeting, Benjamin was just a senator in the New York State Senate and Migdal was the owner of the Migdal organization. The organization runs the Friend of Public Schools Harlem, which is a non-profit in New York. Both men had a largely symbiotic relationship. Migdal would provide funding for some of the charitable initiatives Benjamin was behind, and in return, Benjamin would attend events hosted by Migdal. But in 2019, things got sketchy. Benjamin was planning to run for the post of controller in that state, and he needed a lot of campaign funds. He approached Migdal at around that time and asked for his support in terms of fundraising. He also told Migdal that he needed his help in sourcing tiny campaign donations so that he could take maximum advantage of the New York City Campaign Finance Board matching funds policy. The board has a rule in place to support emerging politicians who don't have a lot of money to fund campaigns. This was a matching funds program where the city provided $8 for every dollar to a campaign by a smaller donor. Hence, just $50 in donations could result in $2,000 in donations from the board. In the same respect, a politician could give up $2 million from the state if they got around $500,000 from small donors in the city, but it wasn't easy to get those donors and Benjamin needed help. So he went to his buddy Migdol, but Migdol refused, arguing that he was more focused on raising funds for his own charitable organization. Further, Migdol explained that he had no experience with that kind of fundraising and that the donors he could secure donations from for Benjamin were also the same donors he would solicit funds from for his own organization. Not long after, Benjamin discovered that his district had leftover discretionary funding for nonprofits and that his funding was about $50,000. So Benjamin, who had no scruples, formed a plan. If he took this money and funneled it to Migdol's nonprofits, they get the funding they needed and Migdol could get donors without costing himself.
The donations would be matched and everyone would be happy. Two weeks after awarding the funds to Migdol's nonprofits, the man came to Benjamin's office with multiple checks that totaled $25,000. Checks were issued by Migdol's relatives that didn't bear his last name and one of the LLCs. The goal of the checks was simple. They were kickbacks masquerading as donations from $50,000 Benjamin awarded to one of his Migdol's charities. Over the next couple of months, Migdol continued to provide Benjamin with tiny payments from small donors as those funds would be eligible for the 8 for 1 campaign funds matching policy by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Aside from sending state funds the way of Migdol's nonprofits, Benjamin also promised to make it easier to get construction permission in certain areas of the state. When Benjamin discovered that law enforcement was on his trail, he started to build a huge web of lies that only sought to obfuscate the real source of his campaign funds. Benjamin didn't disclose that Migdol was the owner of one of the LLCs he was receiving donations from and refused to name Migdol in any of the finance documents he was submitting to New York Campaign Finance Board. When filling out an executive appointment questionnaire to the New York State Office of General Services, he reported that he had never used his powers to assist people in return for donations, even though that's literally exactly what they did. After Benjamin was caught in the lie, he went on to change his story a few times, still never admitting to helping out any specific donor to his campaign. But Brian Benjamin's lies could only hide him for so long. Law enforcement investigations eventually brought the truth of the matter, and he was indicted by a grand jury. After his conviction, he was forced to resign from his job at Lieutenant governor and had defended himself in court number one a bed for money on the 23rd of July, 2022, an Indian politician who had earlier served as the Minister of Commerce and Industries and formerly served as the Education Minister of the Government of West Bengal was arrested. The politician, Partha Chatterjee, was arrested in connection with the State School Service Commission recruitment scam cases along with his aide, actress Arpita Mukherjee. However, Chatterjee's arrest is only the second most interesting thing about this case. The first most interesting thing was that the police found mountains of cash in the houses of his aid. In one of the houses, the police had to use three money counting machines to ascertain exactly how much was recovered. The money was so much that they had to use 10 trunks to pack everything and had to spend 18 hours raiding the house it was in. But they didn't just discover mountains of cash. They also found around five kilograms of gold. The cash was in Indian rupees, but was the equivalent of $2 million when converted to the United States dollar. The houses were raided because the enforcement directorate, India's police department had reason to believe that Chatterjee had taken kickbacks to illegally appoint teachers and staff to the school position. Although the money was found in the homes of his aides, Chatterjee still claimed that none of it was his and that time would vindicate him. Somehow we think that's not very likely. Right now, both Chatterjee and his aide are cooling their heels in police custody. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you think. Can any politician be trusted? And who was the biggest scumbag?